Thank you uh, very much for that generous, exceedingly generous int introduction, but I won't dispute any of it. Uh, uh, we're among friends here. And uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, Malik, especially thank you for, uh, for hosting this wonderful event. Uh, and thank you all for, uh, for being part of this. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, series that you, you have here, and it's an honor for me to be part of it. It's a pleasure, of course, to be back in British Columbia and a great honor to be invited by my friends and colleagues in the Aga Khan Development Network to deliver the 2013 Ismaili Center Lecture. I feel, quite honestly, when I'm with followers and admirers of the Aga Khan, I'm always in good company. Although it is with some embarrassment and a plea for forgiveness that I admit here publicly that this is my first visit to this glorious and in many ways historic Burnaby Center nearly 30 years after its opening. I say that because I followed the Aga Khan network for many years, many decades in fact. As a foreign correspondent in the 1990s, I was privileged to report on some of the projects in rural Gujarat, in the mountain villages of Gilgit, in Pakistan's northern territories, and in the, the uh, bustling slums of Nairobi. I've interviewed His Highness the Aga Khan uh, both in Toronto and in Ottawa. And earlier this year, I was fortunate to be invited to an evening with Kofi Annan and His Highness at the stunning delegation of the Ismaili Imamat in Ottawa. And of course, as a resident of Toronto, I'm watching eagerly and keenly, enthusiastically, as the center in Don Mills takes impressive shape. So it is indeed fulfilling, personally, for me to be here at last at, uh, at, the, Burn at the Burnaby Center. It's also with much thanks that I accept your invitation to share with you my views of Canadian pluralism and how it has evolved in our lifetimes particularly in the four decades since the deplorable expulsion of East Asians from Uganda and the ensuing airlift of thousands, thousands of Ismailis to Canada, an event I would argue actually helped Canadians embrace our new role, indeed our post-British Empire role, as a rights-based bastion of multiculturalism and tolerance. With the benefit of history, we can now start to see the events of the, 19, of the 1970s not just as a turn of history for the Ismaili people, but as a genesis of an evolved and evolving Canadian state. Let me share with you some personal perspectives. Around the time of the exodus from East Africa, I was an adolescent in Scarborough, Ontario. Scarborough was a bit like Burnaby, a suburb of, uh, of a big city. And at the time, there was an influx of Bangladeshi immigrants following another debacle, the 1972 East Pakistan War. And that had incited serious racial tensions in what was then largely an Anglo-Saxon suburb. I still remember, to this day, boys in my grade seven class from a nearby government housing project throwing stones at, uh, at a girl and shouting, Paki, which was a common uh, word, unfortunately, in those days. And I think back to that often, thinking how we've changed as a people. Of course, of course we have episodes of intolerance, indeed far too many, but on the whole, we are a model of harmony for the world. I can say this, quite seriously, is not a subjective view. By one measure, the Migrant Integration Policy Index, which was developed by the British Council to assess policy performance and openness to immigration in Europe and North America, Canada, Canada performs best among all Western countries, by a long shot. We are excellent in labor market mobility, education, family reunion, access to citizenship, anti-discrimination, and long-term residence. The only measure by which we lag is, curiously, political participation. So I hand that over to you. If the Canada of 2013 is more tolerant and worldly, in short, pluralistic, than we were in 1973, it is due in part to the leadership by example of the Ismaili community. Just, with, just, just witness this building and the message that the Aga Khan continues to deliver on Canadian soil. I was inspired this week to hear his remarks at the presentation of the gold medal by the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada in Ottawa. In recalling those dreadful events of the 1970s and the decision by much of the community to move to Canada, he said, there was unanimity that wherever we would settle, we would never become a demotivated, marginalized minority, and that we would instead demonstrate the will and the capacity to rebuild our future. I'm going to say some of the same words that uh, Malik read because they're so inspiring. We therefore decided to build new spaces for the gathering of our communities and for the practice of their faith in the countries that were welcoming us. I witnessed this center 
and a statement not just to the Ismaili people, but to the world, reflecting what the Aga Khan described as our aspirations for the future rather than the tragedy of our recent past. We saw them, he said, as structures where, where we could receive other communities and institutions in a dignified manner and where we could demystify our faith, which was sometimes badly mis misunderstood. They would be symbols of new hope replacing past pain. Symbols of new hope replacing past pain. That's a beautiful message, the idea of symbols of new, new hope, and especially symbols of new hope replacing past pain. It's in the shadow of those towering words and the glow of that simple message of hope that I stand here today to try to share with you my views of pluralism and how it is central to the Canadian identity, enshrined as it is in our laws and modern precedents. I hope to reflect on the many symbols of hope across Canada that bring us together. I also aim to explore the forces in our treatment of human rights and human development that are challenging us anew, from the Parti Québécois' dubious and cynical Charter of Quebec values to the more insidious trends in economic and social development that may give rise in a generation's time to irreconcilable divisions in the status of our people. Whether we admit it or not, Canadians are at a crossroads, and the greatest danger would be for us not to recognize the choices that lie before us. So allow me at this point to turn to some of the forces that unite and divide us. We can probably agree on what unites us. Yes, hockey. <laughs> hockey, maple syrup, perhaps comedy, and a habit of saying sorry. Those are all great Canadian characteristics, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Universal health care and peacekeeping may even be national projects. But it's our collective ability to accommodate minorities, ethnic, religious, sexual minorities, that has made Canada a model and was with us long before Prime Ministers Diefenbaker, Trudeau, and Mulroney attempted in different ways to codify our national beliefs. The idea of min minority rights, majority rule, as you'll remember from history, was seminal to our creation and has always been the Canadian way. It remains the Canadian way. The victorious British, after the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, did not cast out the defeated French. The settlers on the prairies did not seek to annihilate the Cree. We as Canadians have repeatedly, through our history, found ways to reasonably accommodate all. Last Monday evening in Toronto, I and uh, several of you here enjoyed a celebration of the Aga Khan as he received an honorary de degree from the University of Toronto's Tr Trinity College. There could have been no more suitable meeting place. U of T is one of the world's most diverse campuses, located in the heart of what is probably now the world's most diverse city. That's not an entirely new phenomenon. My own ancestors came to our shores in 1783 in New Brunswick, stripped of their land and expelled from the United States for, the, for their loyalty to the British crown and all that it's represented. The local residents, however, did not want them and fired cannons at the uh, loyalist ships on which they uh, sailed, not wanting them to land in the St. John Harbor. So up the shore, the newest Canadians went. A century later, Trinity College's founder, John Strawn, who was also Bishop of Toronto, was a pioneer in reasonable accommodation. In the 1850s, Bishop Strawn was instrumental in the fight, and it was a fight, remarkably, to keep slavery from spreading north, and furthermore, to ensuring escaped slaves from the US South could find a safe haven, a refuge in Upper Canada. During one critical case in which a US, in which <clears throat> During one critical case in which U.S. authorities demanded the extradition of an escaped slave, Thornton Blackburn, who had escaped from a, uh, from a jail in Detroit, crossed, uh, fled across the Detroit River and uh, sought sanctuary in Upper Canada, Bishop Strawn urged the lieutenant governor of the day to guarantee asylum, even if it risked American reprisals. The Americans were furious. They demanded Thornton's return. Uh, saying he was the property of a, uh, of a uh, plantation owner in Kentucky. But Blackburn got to stay and became one of the first black entrepreneurs in Toronto, eventually dying decades later with an impressive real estate portfolio to his name. That spirit, that belief in the inalienability of human rights, was fundamental to our emerging identity, even in the 19th century. It is that identity that I believe made Canada such a natural refuge and ultimately home for Ismaili refugees. 
Our growth as a people is rooted in more than rights, however, as should be true globally. The Trinity College testimony to the Aga Khan made reference to his belief in, quote, the need to uphold human dignity as well as respect for tolerance and plural, 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 pluralism. Of equal importance, the tribute referred to the Aga Khan Development Network's work in 30 developing countries. The network's, under, the, the network's underlying ethic is that of compassion, the statement said, for the most vulnerable, vulnerable in society and service to humanity without regard to faith, origin, and gender. Such values in humanitarian good, individual enterprise, collective will, and human growth from generation to generation, in short, what many of us call progress, are further common bonds of pluralism. Without that progress, human, human rights carry far less meaning. The Aga Khan Network, and it would seem the people of Canada, seem to get that. The idea that pluralism involves both rights and development. But those principles have been sorely tested already in the 21st century, in a decade of terrorism, international war, war accel accelerated global migration, and dizzying technological advance advancements. We've had to ask again and again, what makes us modern and what makes us Canadian? Today, for the most part, Canada remains a model of diversity. Five of our 10 premiers are female. Calgary, one of the country's fastest growing cities, is led by Anis Meli, the first Muslim mayor in North America. Ontario has a lesbian premier. One of the country's biggest corporations until actually today, Rogers Communications, is led by another Ismaili, Nadir Mohammed. Royal Bank of Canada, our biggest publicly traded, traded company, has a female executive chair of the board. Look at the diversity of our immigration too. Across this country, about a quarter of our residents come from somewhere else. A quarter. That's a far greater share than France, Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States, which all seem to have political struggles with integration. And our mix is changing almost continuously. From Bangladeshis to Vietnamese to Tamils to Russians, we have seen source countries surge and stabilize. The Philippines is now the largest source of new Canadians. And yet that may change, as we now accept every year more Arabs than Indians or Chinese. The Canadian story continues. Greater Toronto, Greater Toronto, where I live, is home to more than one million people born outside Canada, including five countries, China, India, Britain, Italy, and the Philippines, that account for at least 5% of the city's population. And there's another 17 countries that account for between 1% and 5% of Toronto's population. A pie chart, if you look at one of Toronto's foreign board population, has come to be called hyper-diversity. There's a lot of slices in the pie. There's no other city like it in the world. Here in Greater Vancouver, a city once defined by three dominant communities, Anglo-Saxon, Sikh, and Chinese, we have a city with one of the largest Persian communities outside of Tehran. In recent years, we've also become a magnet for post-secondary students from around the world. Young people who, by and large, could go to many other countries to study, but choose Canada, in part because of our plural pluralistic ways. Since 2001, the number of international students in Canada has grown 94% to over 265,000 students. Remarkably, these are all largely non-issues in Canada today. There's not much debate about it, as there, uh, as there shouldn't be. In a 2006 survey of immigrants in our three biggest cities, 87% said they felt a very strong or somewhat strong sense of attachment to Canada. This is much higher than response rates to similar questions asked in Western Europe, and higher than the answer given by immigrants in the great melting pot, melting pot of the United States. And so we have become a country that accepted my ancestors off a boat in St. John Harbor, one that opened its doors to millions more over the 20th century, and one that is confident in saying, hey, once you're here, you get all the rights and privileges that everyone else enjoys. Welcome aboard. We know it is not that simple or rosy. Our success in attracting people to Canada and integrating them in our economy and society should not be taken for granted. Nor should our assumption that pluralistic views of citizenship have become universally accepted in our land. 
There are threats to our political assumptions and challenges to our economic success that should concern us all. To illustrate, I need only point to the Quebec Charter of Values, a plan that in an, in an age of multiculturalism seems to yearn for a long gone age of the monoculture. When I agreed to come here today to speak, I mentioned to the organizers that there may be no greater challenge right now to Canadian pluralism than the, than the Quebec Charter. We can talk it down or dismiss it as a cynical political stunt, a ploy to orchestrate the downfall of a minority government or to drive a wedge through the electorate, perhaps even to incite a Supreme Court challenge that would be win-win for the separatists. Either the Canadian court upholds purported unique or distinct Quebec values, or it tramples the democratic rights of Quebecers. The Charter, as you know, seeks to ban so-called ostentatious religious clothing, such as Muslim headscarves and Sikh turbans, for public servants in schools, hospitals, and government offices. The Parti Québécois government makes this argument. All citizens must be treated fairly and equally by the state. There must be no bias, real or perceived, in the delivery of public services, including education. Bernard Dranville, the Minister of Democratic Institutions, put it this way in stressing that only, quote, very visible and very obvious symbols would be banned. Political neutrality, he said, is already expected of public servants. We propose that religious neutrality apply to all people working for the state. In an earlier interview with Le Devoir last spring, he argued, and I quote, Quebec society is more and more multi-ethnic and multi-religious, which is an exceptional richness. But we want to be able to properly manage this diversity. We will have to give ourselves rules and common values. Now a red flag for me goes up whenever I hear someone talking about managing public values or personal beliefs. The argument is furthermore riddled with fallacies in principle and practice. The Quebec Association of Health and Social Service Institutions has reported that none of its members have ever had any problem with staff who wear religious apparel. In 2007, the Bouchard-Taylor Commission, looking into reasonable accommodation, found that after examining 900 briefs and 13 academic studies, the supposed crisis of, a, of religious accommodation was largely, quote, a crisis of perception. Charles Taylor, the prominent intellectual who co-chaired the commission, has called the latest proposals Putinesque. Hydro-Quebec, he has said, isn't hydro-Catholic, hydro-Muslim, or hydro-atheist. And then putting one of uh, the most, of, and then putting one of our most cherished principles, quite simply, he said, employees are individuals, they are free. Employees are individuals, they are free. Let us remind ourselves, this is not just about Quebec. It's about human rights, which are inalienable and universal across Canada. That's why we have a ch Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That charter is one of the reasons people move to Canada. And so, my concern is not just with the Quebec Charter and the politics around it, but with the reaction. Within Quebec, a large number of people, especially outside of Montreal, support it. A Leger poll in late September found that 46% of the province's adult population considered immigration to be a threat to the heritage of Quebec society. Now that 46% shoots up to 57% in rural areas. Many of us take comfort in the Canadian Charter and the resolve of our courts to enforce its principles, which surely will stymie the PQ plot. Let us also, let us also take comfort in the courage of the many Canadians who have stood up for our beliefs. And it's not just the political leaders, although they should be applauded. You may recall when the Quebec Soccer Federation tried to ban religious head coverings. The announcement led to protests by young Canadian soccer players right across the country, including many Muslims, and a brave decision by the Canadian Soccer Association to suspend the Quebec Federation. Only then, in the face of national and international shame, did the Quebec Federation reverse its position. There is a simple yet profound message in these cases. We have legal instruments, such as the Charter, to protect and enhance plural, pl pluralism, 
but it takes the diligence and the voice of everyone to make it work. If the legal minds in the room will forgive me for saying this, pluralism is too important to be left in the hands of lawyers. It must be assured in the hearts and minds of all. Thomas Jefferson knew this when he drafted the Virginia Statute for, Relig for Religious Freedoms in 1777. As he said then, our civil rights have no dependence on our religious opinions any more than our opinions in physics and geometry. Moreover, the Virginia Statute states, imposing what were then called punishments of burdens on the free practice of religion tends to, and these are Jefferson's words, beget habits of hypocrisy, <coughs> excuse me, beget habits of hypocrisy and meanness. I think back to the Aga Khan's description of this building as a symbol of new hope and see it in stark contrast to, the, to those legislative efforts to instill what Jefferson would have called hypocrisy and meanness. Now, the Quebec Charter is but one obvious challenge to Canadian pluralism. I'd like to highlight two subtler, threat, subtler threats that lurk in the corridors of education and employment. First, education. We have the opposite experience to Western Europe. Immigrants here do remarkably well in schools, completing high school and university at rates unheard of in most Western countries and well ahead of the non-immigrant population. The first generation post-secondary particip participation rate across Canada is 57%. Second generation, i.e. people born in Canada to, Im to immigrant parents, is 54.3%. And for third generation and beyond, such as me, 37.7%. But here's a potential source of friction, the noticeable gap in education between immigrant communities. To put it bluntly, first and second generation Canadians from East and South Asia do exceptionally well. Those from Africa, the Caribbean, and parts of Latin America, much less so. For first generation Chinese immigrants, the post-secondary participation rate is 88%. For those from Africa, 65%. This disparity is doubly challenged by a concerning gap in primary and secondary school performance based on location and income. In a recent series on income inequality, my newspaper revealed important links between income, neighborhood, and school performance. Where you live determines the quality of schooling that you will get in this country. According to data, to data from the Toronto District School Board, nearly 60% of the city's students who are enrolled in gifted programs, 60%, come from the three highest deciles, including 25% from the very highest income group. Only 11% come from the three lowest deciles, which in Toronto, can be skewed towards new Canadians. Since education is a key determinant of economic success, and in turn economic success increasingly determines educational outcomes in our country, we may soon find ourselves in a country of self-perpetuating enclaves of success and stagnation, otherwise known as ghettos, many of them characterized by ethnicity. It's hard to see that as a sign of pluralism if one believes that the, that the ideal is rooted in both rights and development. That takes me to the other major challenge to the, to the practice of plural, pluralism, which is jobs and income. Now don't get me wrong, I'm very far from advocating some sort of socialist approach to the divisions in our society. When I moved to India in 1991, I got a good sense of what a state-directed society can look like. Yes, India at the time was more balanced income-wise, but that was because pretty much everyone was stuck below a global standard. That's not good. A free market, including an open and competitive labor market, is essential, in my view, to a growing economy. So too is income mobility. We've heard a lot lately about income inequality. I would suggest we be more concerned about income mobility, the opportunity for people to move up, and yes, down, the income ladder. This is especially important right now in Canada, and for the 300,000 people who move here every year, literally seeking mobility. First, some good news, really good news, in fact. New Canadians 
do fairly well for employment and have done much better than non-immigrants since the recession of 2008. According to the Toronto Immigrant Employment Data Initiative, the unemployment rate for immigrant youth aged 15 to 24 is a full percentage point lower than that for all youth in the Toronto area. What this misses, of course, is the participation rate. According to Statistics Canada, the employment rate for immigrant youth was 44% in 2011, a full 14 percentage points lower than that for Canadian-born youth. In other words, immigrant, immigrant youth are too often excluded from the formal or mainstream workforce and economy. Also masked, again, are important divisions between immigrant groups. The highest rate for, of employment is found among Filipinos, who tend to have post-secondary education and for the most part come to Canada still under the live-in caregiver program and therefore have stable, recession-resistant employment. African-born immigrants, on the other hand, who make up nearly 10% of the immigrant workforce, aged uh, at least age 25 to 54, face a starker picture. In 2011, this group had the lowest employment rate and highest unemployment rate at 12.6% of all immigrants. Unemployment for African-born immigrants aged 25 to 54 who have been here less than five years was dead last at 21.3%. We are all well aware of the risks of such divisions. Just look at the United States or parts of Western Europe and should not assume the charter is enough to, br to bridge these divisions in our society. So what can we do? Well, let me sum up my remarks by outlining four broad needs that I'd suggest we may want to take on in the com coming years. First of all is universal health care that innovates. Yes, health care is essential to plural pluralism. In health care, we have it. Let's not abuse it. Health care is the number one determinant of economic success and among our greatest national assets. While there is plenty of room for innovation and efficiency and better cost management, Universal health care is critical to our sense of any plurality in our society. The proverbial fresh off the airplane immigrant should have the same access to quality health care as I do, the eighth generation Canadian, if we are to have a healthy, educated society based on equality of opportunity. The same is true of education, whether you are in Halifax or Prince Rupert. I've spoken of the challenges to schooling and especially ensuring outcomes do not become too divergent or worse predetermined by, uh, by ethnicity and neighborhood. And that leads me to the next challenge, which is education that integrates. Schools need more than money. In a diverse society such as ours, they need cultural accommodation, especially in the early years. Uh, a remarkable study by uh, the by Oxford University, looking at immigration and diversity among Western countries, found Canada to be excellent in intercultural education, except on two counts. One, allowing schools to modify curricula and teaching materials for the local population. And two, adjusting daily life in school to the culture and beliefs of pupils. It's worth noting the Toronto School Board is now allowing and assisting school-driven diversity led by principals, recognizing that children learn better, especially in the early years, when they are in familiar and comfortable milieus. We can actually learn a few lessons from the Mumbai School Board, which offers primary education in seven languages. One reason that city has become India's pluralistic leader, the Shiv Sena notwithstanding. This view of schools as welcoming and integrating environments should extend to campuses too where we may be seeing more divisions than we've known in the past. We've had a historic leap in foreign student enrollment in Canada in the past decade, and a significant number of those students stay. That's great for Canada. Across the country, the Chinese student population makes up over 30% of the entire international student body, and is greater than the percentage of students from India, Korea, and Saudi Arabia combined. The South Asian population, however, is gaining ground growing 217% in the past four years. But our campuses are not doing enough to integrate those students in a pluralistic society. Consider a survey done of international students across Canada and their attitudes. Slightly more than half, 55%, indicated that their friends primarily consist of other international students. 
About one third, 34% of students, are friends with a mix of Canadian and international students, and approximately 7% are friends primarily with Canadian students. That does not reflect the culture that I know our campuses espouse. Our third challenge, a labor market that mobilizes. If we are to maintain a pluralistic society, we all need to have access to a plurality of life and work choices. At the core of that challenge is labor mobility. The United States was once the most mobile of societies, and its diversity showed as people moved south and west, and back north and east again, in search of opportunities, regardless of race, religion, or personal choice. Canadians today are increasingly mobile, led by new Canadians, and the country benefits. Look around us here in British Columbia and you have proof positive, with residents who have moved here from every point east. In 2011, more than half the employment growth for Canada's landed immigrants was accounted for by immigrants living in the prairies in British Columbia. While those immigrants made up 31% of Canada's immigrant workforce, they accounted for 53% of the immigrant employment growth in the last couple of years. Now, to ensure this trend continues and even accelerates, we need to address structural rigidities, including faster certification of overseas professional standards, a national skills program along the lines, along the lines of what the federal government is currently pushing on reluctant provinces, and notably an overhaul of the employment insurance program that gets in the way of a mobile society. That may not sound like it has much to do with pluralism, but if we have chunks of our society chuck in, stuck in one place because of regionally driven public policies, we stand greater prospects of division. I was reminded of this recently at an, at an editorial board meeting at the Globe and Mail with Brad Wall, the progressive and conservative premier of Saskatchewan, who recalled flying over the high unemployment maritimes to get to a trade fair in Ireland. Despite our unemployment rates, especially in Atlantic Canada, he and a private sector team had to leave the country to recruit thousands of young workers. Since then, Saskatchewan has benefited from a wave of Irish pipe fitters, nannies, restaurant workers, while other parts of, the, of Canada have stagnated. Premier Wall made the argument that we cannot continue to flourish as a country, not just economically but socially, if we don't encourage Canadians, new and old, to move from province to province and city to city. Now, the fourth uh, issue I'd like to, to highlight before wrapping up is citizen, citizenship that both inspires change and withstands it. As all of you know from Canadian history, we've enjoyed several waves of immigration and have emerged in the, in the 21st century with a stronger sense of citizenship that has value, integrity, and a single national purpose. This is what the Quebec Charter debate comes down to, our openness to others with a law that treats us all the same. Now let's bear in mind our approach to citizenship is also aggressive and is changing our country very quickly. In the past decade, we have accepted about 70 new citizens for every 1,000 that we already have, well more than double the rate of other Western countries. About three quarters of our foreign-born population are citizens. In Britain, it's less than half. This is huge. It reduces the divide, the sense of us and them, and it gives them this message that we're all Canadians. We're all here to stay, so we better get used to each other. I think Canadians have come to accept that and embrace it. it. It also gives immigrants better access to institutions, to schools, courts, hospitals, and the ballot box. To quote that Oxford University study on immigration and diversity, quote, it seems an obvious point, but the more openness you demonstrate, the more immigrants feel welcome. I hope today I've been able to lay out for you some ideas on how we can better prepare for the future. Our plural, pluralism must be about more than open doors. We need to be steadfast in our commitment to both the rights and development that stitch together a diverse and progressive society. We have the Charter, of course, and must be mindful of perennial attempts to undermine, undermine it or negotiate away its principles. We have excellent schools, colleges, universities, hospitals, and healthcare and need to appreciate how those are not just good in their own right, but help reduce the socioeconomic divisions that can lead to racial, ethnic, and religious tensions. Lastly, we need to be mindful of the public policies and private sector practices that
that perhaps unintentionally limit access to schooling and post-secondary education, especially among some groups of new Canadians, and how that could lead to ghettoization of entire groups of Canadians based on, as Martin Luther King said, of America in the 1960s, the color of their skin rather than the quality of their minds. We have what the world wants and needs. We also know where we need to innovate in cross-cultural cross schooling, in skills and training, in labor market mobility, in the integration of informal workers, especially those with skills and certification from other countries. No country has been better set up for the 21st century than Canada. I was reminded of this recently, taking my 13-year-old daughter back to uh, Scarborough to a soccer game where, in which she was playing, near the place where racism boiled in the 1970s, when I was her age. That part of Toronto now looks to have more mosques and temples than churches. Islamic benevolent societies sit next to the ro to rotary clubs, and hockey rinks have given way to soccer domes, where girls from every background imaginable compete on, literally, a level playing field. It's the Canada we all cherish. Thank you for helping build that country, and by listening tonight, I hope volunteering to take on the challenges that lie ahead. We are at a crossroads where fundamental rights remain needlessly a topic of debate and where the basic elements of human development remain, it seems, negotiable. Each of us will be counted on to stand up to those challenges. I feel confident the Ismaili community and this centre will continue to be at the forefront. It's been an honour to be with you today. Thank you again for your time. I look forward to a lively discussion.